Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. All right. Well, howdy. howdy. Good to see you guys. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're in Psalm 22. And I want to read it to you uh, in its entirety before we pray and then dive into it. If you don't have a Bible, they're bringing some around. And if you don't own a Bible, uh, I think you can keep it. Um, and uh, so by all means, do so. But Psalm 22, uh, let me read it to you and uh, get all of our heads around it. And then we'll uh, talk through it together. So Psalm 22, beginning in verse... One says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you're holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is here and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All the offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vow I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the ones who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I want to thank you for every person here today. And I just want to ask you for your help, God, that you would lay out very clearly before us a a picture of our lives and how we process the joys and pains that we experience in the midst of our journey through life. And then I pray you would lay bare before us your word and what it is you're saying about how the world works. And Father, I just pray for a beautiful, mystical, life-changing union of your word and our life that will stabilize us as we enter into the unknown that awaits us. Give us hope this morning 
I'm asking. And I want to invite all of you, if you're willing, to take a minute and you ask him. Say, God, please teach me something today. And then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I would be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last weekend was Easter, and before we get too far away from Easter, I think there's an important question we've got to ask and answer about what happened in those days. Uh, There was a moment during the crucifixion of Jesus Christ where he uttered one of the most famous lines ever spoken in human history. Like, even if you don't read the Bible, aren't familiar with it, you probably know or have heard that while hanging on the cross, Jesus cried out at one point, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the important question we got to answer before we move away from those days of contemplating his death and burial is, why did he say that? What was going on when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did he say that? Like, was that a cry of defeat? Albert Schweitzer believed so. He came forth and said that that cry from Jesus, why have you forsaken me, indicated that Jesus died as, quote, a deluded apocalyptic, his messianic expectations unfulfilled. Is that true? Is that what that was about? That this man who had preached hope his entire life there, when the situation got difficult enough, did he lose all hope? Or more than that, in his moment of great need, did God abandon him? That's pretty disturbing. Like, why would you call that a good Friday? That's not good. That's horrible. That if there's no better person on the planet than Jesus Christ and God abandoned him in his time of great need, then what hope do you have and what hope do I have when we hit our difficult moments in life? So if we can just be selfish for a moment, we got to come around that and go, if God abandoned Jesus and there's no greater guy, what hope do I have when my life gets hard? And I thought about in this moment listing off examples from my life of suffering I've been through, physical, spiritual, emotional, or even that my staff's been through recently with the the number of funerals we've had to attend and ICUs we've sat in, but the truth is none of you need that. All of us have our own pain we've experienced, whether external crisis or maybe there isn't even some external factor, just an internal emotional sense of what's wrong with me. Some of you, that's the hardest thing. And my question is, what's, what do we do with that? And will God ditch us in our time of great need? And so what I want to do is we got to figure out, why did Jesus say that? And what does it mean for me when I enter into my time of suffering? Those are the questions we got to answer. And we're going to do it by looking at Psalm 22. And you go, why? Because I think a lot of us know that when Jesus cried that out on the cross, why have you forsaken me? It was a quote from Psalm 22. He was quoting a passage written by King David around 1,000 B.C., so about 1,000 years before the life of Jesus, this psalm was written that Jesus quotes. And so what I want to do is look at the original context and go, what was going on when the psalmist cried that out, and why was it Jesus' cry of choice when he was on the cross, and then look at what does it mean for us when our day of suffering comes. And so to look at it in its original context, the psalm opens with that heart-wrenching lament. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And it's interesting when you read those first two verses to ask the question, what's disturbing the writer? And the truth is, you don't get a lot of information about whatever crisis it is he's going through. And the truth is, he is going through a crisis he wants to end. Is there physical pain? Probably. But if you read the first two verses, that's not the focus. What's disturbing him so greatly and why he cries that out is not even the pain he's going through, though it is significant. It's the sense of God's distance. What's upsetting to the writer is not just I'm going through problems, but I'm going through problems, and where are you? It's that sense of contradiction 
between faith and experience that's disturbing him. Because in his faith, if you notice, three times he calls him my God, and he connects the transcendent with the intimate. He says, you're, you're God. You're the ruler of the universe, but you're my God. He calls him by the covenant name, Yahweh, in a couple verses. Like, you're my God. I'm connected with you in covenant. And the way that worked back then and the way it works now is that when you're in a covenant with God, you say, I'm bringing my whole life. My life is yours. And then you, God, come into my life to take care of me, namely as protector and provider. And so here, that's his understanding of their relationship. I'm yours, and you're my protector and provider. So he hits a moment of crisis and says, okay, God, I'm calling it in. Come through for me. Here's the moment I need you. And he gets silence. And it's the silence that's deafening for him. It's the silence that's disturbing to him. What's the biggest problem here is that sense of rejection. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Where you go, man, I'm really going through it. And you want to run to God and go, God, help me. And yes, the pain is hard, but to run to God and to feel like he slams the door and then you hear the bolt click, that's painful. The sense of I'm going to go through this alone, that kind of suffering is what disturbs him. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Probably my, my first time ever that I recall was in high school. Man, I was the good Christian kid. I was, did the stuff you were supposed to do, did it all right. And then so my freshman year of college, I got hit with a number of crises. And I'm like, okay, God, I've clocked the hours with you. Come be here with me. And for over a year, I just felt like all I got was silence from the heavens. And that's difficult. And so he struggles with, okay, God, I'm in my moment of need. Where are you? And what's interesting is, he decides to press into that. He decides to press into it and go, no, seriously, why have you forsaken me? And he starts to try to wrestle with it. If it's a relational breakdown with you and me, what's going on here? Is it you? Did something change in you? Did you say, I'm going to be here for you? I'm not just kidding. I'm out. Like, is it you? And then you see in verse three, he says, no, because he says, yet you are holy. No, you're pure. You're not duplicitous. You don't change. You didn't promise to be there and then change your mind. You are holy, and you're enthroned on the praises of your people. Back then, they would worship in the temple, and they would swing incense, and the incense would fill the temple, and there was a, a seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant called the Mercy Seat. It was a picture of God's throne, and God wanted it that way. He said, this incense that's rising around the throne, he says, think about that as your prayers as they rise up to me. And so here the psalmist is saying, I'm crying out and you're not here. Did you change? No, you're not like that. And my prayers, they rise up to you. Your people's voices do rise to your throne. You told us that. And not only that, our fathers trusted you and it worked for them. And he says three times in the past, they trusted, trusted, trusted you and you came through for them. There's precedent here. And yet rather than that comforting him, it distresses him. Because he says, in you our fathers trusted, they trusted, you delivered them. They cried, you rescued. They trusted, they were not put to shame. But now I groan, and you're far from saving me. I cry, and you don't answer. I cry, and I find no rest. And what's stressing him out is that contradiction between what I think I know about God, but then what I'm experiencing in my pain. And so he goes, okay, if there's a disconnect here and it's not you, God, you're holy, you don't change, that you hear the cries of your people, it worked in the past, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the problem. Maybe it's the fact that I'm a nobody to you. And he says in verse six, I'm a worm and not a man. Maybe it's just that. I remember sitting with a friend that had gone through some pretty horrible uh, things in, in her life and as a Christian girl, she said, you know what, Ben, I've, I've, I've punted this whole conversation with God. I'm done because in my moment of great need, I cried out for him to help and he wasn't there for me. And she said, I guess uh, I wasn't worth his time. And here the psalmist says, I'm a worm, not a man. Maybe that's the problem is I'm a nobody. And not just am I a nobody, I'm a joke. He says, I'm scorned by mankind despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths of me. They wag their heads at me, saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. The primary problem in the psalmist here is not the physical suffering he's going through. It's the silence of God. 
The secondary problem, the twist of the knife, is that the heavens are silent, but the people aren't. They mock him. They make fun of him. People can be pretty cruel sometimes, right? See also the internet. It's the world we live in. And here he says, I'm crying out for help, and what I'm getting is mocked. And what hurts about it, you go, why does he care what they think? What hurts is it's the twinge of truth to it. I am God's man. I am committed to God. I do believe in him. And now they're all watching you not come through for me. And so that's what flips him again. You see him wrestling? I need help, and you're not here. But you're holy, and you listen, but I'm still in pain. And he goes, well, maybe I'm a nobody. But then in verse 9, he flips around and goes, okay, maybe I am a nobody, but I'm your nobody. Because he says in verse 9, you are the one who took me from the womb. You made me trust in you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. He says, okay, I'm a nobody, but you, 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 you came and got me. You're the one who signed me up to be in relationship with you. So I'm nobody, but I'm your nobody. And so I know that you don't change. I know that you listen to your people. I know you've answered when they cry. And I'm crying and I don't hear from you. You're not talking to me. And there's nothing in me that would make me worthy of listening to you. But you came and got me. So you're holy and you listen and you got me. So here it comes. I'm just going to press in. And in verse 11, he says it. Be not far from me. For trouble is near and none can help. He says, I'm going through it, and I know I don't deserve any of your attention, but you're all I got in this moment, and I'm your nobody, so let me just go ahead and say it. Be not far from me. Be close to me. Be near me. There's something beautiful about that, because you don't engage in formal relationships with language like that. You don't say that to your banker. Be near me. Be close to me. You don't talk to your boss like that. He doesn't want that kind of relationship with you. You talk to your spouse like that, though. You should. If there's relational or emotional distance, you say, I don't want this distance anymore. We can go through anything if I know you're with me. Close the distance here. And notice this. This is how the believer talks to God in pain. And he presses into God in the pain, not away. And what you find in him doing that is you get some clarity on verse 1. That cry, why have you forsaken me, is not a cry of a loss of hope. It's the presence of hope that leads him to cry out like that. If you lose hope, you stop talking. It's hope that presses you in to keep talking. And if you missed it implicitly in the why, you catch it explicitly in verse 11 when he says, don't be far from me. I want you near me. He doesn't distance from God in his pain. He moves towards God. And so that why is not a cry of a loss of hope. I guess you've given up, so I give up. It's from hope. You don't keep pressing in with language like this if you don't think he listens or cares. Talk to any marriage counselor. They say, you know the marriages that are in real trouble? He said, let me tell you, when you see a couple come in, the marriages that aren't in serious trouble are the ones where they're yelling at each other. That's actually a good thing. I mean, it's not a good thing. But what's happening? They're yelling at each other. Why? Because there's still this deep burning in them to be understood. Listen to me. You're not hearing me. Connect with me on this. Understand me. They're still yelling at each other, and they may be processing in unhealthy ways and saying some unhelpful sentences, but at least they're facing each other and saying, I'm working through this. I'm in this. You can bend what's hot. They said the scary ones are the ones where one party just goes, you know what? I'm done. I don't care. I don't care what you think. I don't care how you feel. I don't care. It's when the conversation stops. They say, that's the marriage where there's no hope. Because you can bend what's hot. What's cold shatters. And he says, here, this psalm is red hot. I am struggling, and rather than distancing from you, I feel like you've forsaken me, so I'm going to press into you and say that. And I'm going to say it with a why, and then I'm going to say it with a directly, be not far from me. And what you see is when he was crying out, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't from no hope that he was saying it. He wasn't asking, and I think Golden Gate gets this exactly right, that cry of why is not the cry of explanation. It's a call to action. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus, when he cried it on the cross, wasn't looking for a list of reasons. He was looking for it to stop. 
He was looking for verse 11, be not far from me. I see this in my own life and the way I talk to my kids. When my little two-year-old or three-year-old are being really whiny, I'll notice, I just say it to him, I go, why are you whining like that? And when I say that, I'm not looking for explanation. Well, because uh, I don't respect you, and uh, I didn't nap well, and uh, like, I'm not, oh, okay, that really clears it up. Carry on. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm saying why. What I mean is stop, right? And that's what's happening here. Why have you forsaken me is him saying not give me a few reasons. It's saying, stop forsaking me. It's saying, verse 11, be near me. It's saying, why is this taking so long? That's what he's saying. It's a cry from hope, not a loss of hope. I think Jesus cried out this psalm. Why? Because it's a real cry of pain. I think he understood when he was going to the cross, I'm taking the sins of the world on me, and this intimate relationship I've always known with God will be broken and separated. I think he knew that pain was coming. I think when he got into it, as he hung there, he hit a moment where he said, why is this taking so long? Why is this taking so long? I remember for me, when I hurt my back, uh, one of the times, uh, I had herniated disc in my lower back, nerve pain through my legs, and I had to lay on my face on the floor for better part of a month. And I remember it was so sensitive at one point that even when the AC would click on in the house, Just that shudder in the air would cause my back to spasm and pain to go down my legs. It's really tough. And then I got the hiccups (laughs) from the medication I was on. And up until that point, I had been really theologically on point. I mean, I was just like, Lord, I trust you in the midst of pain. I believe you're sovereign over it and there's purposes, even though I don't understand them. But about an hour or two into the hiccups, I just went, really? (laughs) Is Is that really necessary? It wasn't enough? Why is this taking so long? And I think that's what Jesus is doing. And what's beautiful about that, before I move on from this point, is can I just tell you, we're called to talk to God like that. The psalmist cries out from real pain at God about it. Jesus does as well, and you're meant to as well. I think what Jesus was doing was a real cry of real pain, but it doesn't totally answer our question, and that is, why choose this psalm? He could have said a lot of things in the middle of his pain. He could have quoted a lot of other psalms. Why quote this one? Well, I think it was because it articulates his pain, but I think it's also because he's a good teacher. Because I think there in the midst of his suffering, he cried out a psalm that his people would know, and as they called their mind back to a psalm that they would have committed to memory, they would think about the progress of it, and as you look at these cycles that happen in 12 through 15 and 16 through 18, as he goes deeper into his pain, you relate to some of it, and then at one point, it just goes shooting past you of going, yeah, I don't know what that's like, and it starts to get strangely specific. And in verse 12, he says, many bulls encompass me. He calls his enemies bulls, and he calls them later lions and dogs, oxen. Why? Because they are strength without conscience. He says they're like bulls, strong bulls. You think about strength from Bashan. That was an area known for its well-fed livestock. He says, my enemies are at the peak of their strength, and they surround me. And they're open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. They want to use that strength to destroy me. And while my enemies are at their strongest, I am at my weakest. He says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. He says, I have no structure left to me. I went hiking a few weeks ago, and we went 18 miles, a buddy of mine and I. And on the way back in from the hike, at one point he goes, my legs are jello. And you go, why did he say that? Why that image? And what he was trying to say is, I've been pushed so far past exhaustion, my legs have lost structure. They're like a structureless thing. They didn't have jello in 1000 BC. (laughs) So he says, My body's like water, it's like wax. Water has no structure. Wax, you see it melt in loose form. He says, My enemies are at their strongest, me. He said, There's no soundness to me. I'm at my absolute weakness. I am coming apart. And then he says something really interesting in verse 15. 
you lay me in the dust of death. That's a significant change in pronoun. He says, my enemies are surrounding me. My enemies want to destroy me. And then he looks up in God and says, and you, you're the one behind all this. You're the one in this. Why would he say something like that? See, some people in the midst of their pain, they want to distance God from it. God wouldn't have anything to do with that, right? Because they don't want you to get that sense of betrayal that God's involved in your suffering in any way. My question in this is, which is worse? God being involved or not? So my two-year-old, a couple weeks ago, went, had to go in and get shots. Bad day. Hard day to give shots to a two-year-old because you can't really unpack the reasons, right? They just know you marched them in the room and a bunch of adults surround them and start to stab them. And it's, uh, <laughs> they don't like it. And they shouldn't. Question. With that little two-year-old, with their limited understanding of what's going on here, which is worse? for mommy to be in the room and to look up at her in a moment of betrayal of going, why are you doing this? Why are you letting him do this to me? And to feel that betrayal, but yet maybe somewhere behind that go, but, but I know you love me. There's some precedent to you taking care of me in my life. So I don't understand this moment at all. But in the context of knowing you care about me, maybe there is some purpose behind it that I can't even see. Maybe is it good to have mommy in the room with that possibility of hope underneath it? Or better to have mommy just out of the room and you surrender to the hands of evil men. And in the middle of the psalm, catch it. The psalmist says, I'm in a horrible way. I'm in a bad place. But God, I know you're behind it. I know you're back there. I know you're somehow in this. You're letting this play out like this. And I don't know the reasons, but I cling to that. It's really bad, but God is ruling over this. And then it gets really specific. He says, the dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That Hebrew word means pierced, to bore holes in. I can count all my bones. It means his body stretched out so he can see his bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now some of you hear this part and you go, I've heard all that. I, I know all that. Uh, pierced hands and feet can see all my bones. They're mocking me. They divide my clothes. That sounds like the crucifixion of Jesus. And you're right. It does. And this is an important moment to keep in mind that this was written 1,000 years before the birth of Jesus. That's pretty profound. Like America will turn 240 years old next year. This is four times as long a distance as there's been in America, and they're talking about that experience with this kind of specificity. That's like the Vikings describing the iPhone. You swipe left if you want to. That would be weird. <laughs> and yet, don't catch this. It starts to open up to you the window of maybe this is why Jesus cried out this psalm, that in the midst of the crazy, and his disciples look up and try to imagine that. They followed this man all their life. They believed he was the answer, the hero, and they're watching him get brutally murdered while people laugh. Think about the craziness of watching their dreams get dashed in that moment. And then Jesus cries out Psalm 22. And it's a cry of horrible anguish. And yet in the midst of that, it's a quote from a psalm that begins to talk about the fact that his hands will be pierced while they mock him and divide up his clothes and it begins to dawn on you, oh, wait a second, maybe there's something to this. And they didn't miss that. And you see the gospel writers looked around and picked up on that. And so Matthew 27, you see him say in verse 35, when they crucified him, put holes in him, they divided his garments by casting lots. Verse 39, and when those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. Verse 41, the chief priests and scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he trusts in God. Let God deliver him if he desires him. And then verse 46, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Me. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you start to see why Jesus picked this psalm. So that his disciples, in the midst of watching their dreams get crushed in front of their face, could feel the distress of that, and yet behind it there's a sliver of hope. 
that God called this, God saw this, there's a plan in this, a plan from of old, and there's a little sliver of hope in that. There's not a ton of hope in that. You go, okay, God planned this. Why? For what? But they start to hear God's behind it. And then there's a shift in the psalm. And you see in verses 19 and 20, it kind of sounds like what it sounded like. The verbs in 19 are don't be far off, come quickly to my aid. Verse 20, deliver my soul. Verse 21, save me. And so you hear him again, don't be far from me, come from me, deliver me, save me. And then right in the middle of verse 21, we're not even to the next verse yet. He says, you have rescued me and delivered me from the horn of the wild oxen. Say what? When? When did that happen? Like at what point in the middle of Psalm 21 did it go from, don't be far from me, come to me, deliver me, save me. You rescued me. It's awesome. You go, when? And you see the, the rabbis and teachers of around this text are like, yeah, I don't know. That's weird. But he puts it in the perfect tense. It's done. I'm out. He delivered me with no explanation how, but then he moves on and it, it's a total tonal shift. He says, now I'm no longer surrounded by bulls or lions or dogs. He says in verse 22, I'm surrounded, but he says, I'll tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of a congregation, I'll praise you. There's a scene shift. Now I'm surrounded by the brothers and we're celebrating God together. He says in verse 23, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Jacob. Why? Well, then he tells you in verse 24, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not hidden his face from him, but has heard when I cried. He didn't reject me. He didn't forsake me. It took a lot longer than I thought it should, but he came and not only did he come from me, for me, in verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. He says, after this moment of suffering, a praise is gonna rise up from a whole congregation of people. My vows I'll perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. The writer says, when I went through suffering, he rescued me. And not only did he hear my cries when I was afflicted, he will now hear the cries of all the afflicted and they will come and eat a banquet together. Jesus said as much. On the night he was betrayed, do you remember his last supper? He looked at the disciples and held up that bread and broke it and said, this is my body that's about to break. And he held up that wine and said, this is my blood that's about to pour out. And then he picked up the final glass of wine for the evening. It was called the cup of consummation. And he was supposed to say a little prayer and then drink it. But he took it and set it down and said, I will not drink of the vine again until I come in my kingdom. And I'll have a drink with you. And he tells them, I will be rejected, brutalized, broken, blood poured out. Banquet with you. The disciples didn't understand that at all. They're like, uh, okay. And yet now it's starting to make sense that there's hope beyond the affliction, not just for the afflicted one, but for all the afflicted who are part of his name. And not only just the Jewish people, in verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. What happened to this righteous sufferer will be celebrated to the ends of the earth. All the families of every nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. Rich people are invited. Him that shall bow down to the dust, even the one who couldn't keep himself alive, the poor and downtrodden are invited posterity shall serve him it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to people yet unborn that he's done it and it says not only did the afflicted person get heard and rescued all the afflicted will now be celebrating at a banquet together and not just all the ones now in this place but all nations all families for all time will gather around to celebrate that God heard the cries of the afflicted one and vindicated him and gave hope to us all and as you start to read about this, you realize this isn't about the King David anymore. This isn't about some guy in 1000 BC. This is about the son of David. This is about the true king. 
This is about Jesus Christ, who came and lived the perfect life we could not, went through horrible affliction on the cross as they pierced him, and he bled, and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he said, it's finished. And they buried him in the grave. And then three days later, he rose. And he's alive. And now freedom and forgiveness and hope beyond your afflictions, hope beyond your suffering, hope beyond even the grave is available to all nations, all families, all people that we generations later, posterity are talking about this afflicted righteous one who went through affliction and because he went through it and rose, we have hope and we can celebrate and we can cry out in thanksgiving to a God who rules over the nations and hears the cries of the afflicted. Afflicted. Hope rises for us today because of King Jesus who went through this and gave hope to all who were afflicted. So to answer our questions, why did Jesus say that? I think it was a true expression of his anguish on the cross to describe the pain of being forsaken by God for us. But I think in his brilliance as a teacher, he cried out the psalm that would point to us that even my pain is by God's design. What does it mean for us? This gives us permission in the midst of our pain to talk to God honestly about where our heart is. He wants us to talk to him like that. And it also gives us hope that God took the darkest day in history, the murder of Jesus, and made it an instrument of redemption, not just for Jesus, but for Jewish people, all nations, all families, for all time are invited to celebrate a God who will come to us even when we're in anguish. There is hope for us beyond the grave. And so what's left for us is to celebrate this God. Hebrews chapter two quotes the happy part of Psalm 22 of the brothers singing praises in the congregation. And it attributes it to Jesus. And it's an interesting moment in the book of Hebrews because you go, when did Jesus quote that part? He quoted verse one. When did he quote verse 22? And the answer is, oh. Writer of Hebrews doesn't say. Some people think Jesus said it on the cross, that he didn't just read line one of Psalm 22. He said the whole thing, though it is dark, I will rise and I am coming and I will sing with a congregation of my brothers because the Lord has done it. Others think maybe he said it later. I don't know. All I know is that he said it. And as the writer of Hebrews unpacks the significance of that, it's, he said that Jesus had to be made like his brothers, that is us, in every respect that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. He's been there. He knows your pain. He's a sympathetic high priest. He knows what it is to go through affliction. He knows what it is to cry out in the midst of pain. But he also knows what it is to see vindication and rescue from his loving God. And it's available to all of us who will trust in his name. That even in our darkest day, we can have hope that God who brought life out of death will do the same with us and that the God we cry out to knows our pain and cares. And at the end, though we may weep for a time, we will not have questions at the end. What we will have is celebration of a God who rules the nations and offers a banquet to all those who trust in his name. Let me pray for us. Lord, I want to thank you that you don't sugarcoat or try to hide from us or cover over the fact that life is hard. Difficult times are coming in all different myriad ways or are here in our midst now. But thank you, God, that you're not distant and remote and clinical about it. Your son, Jesus Christ, lived among us and took up our infirmities and lived in the midst of our pain. He knows what it's like. And so when we cry out in our suffering, he's a sympathetic priest because he's been there. He knows what it's like. Thank you for the invitation to struggle with you. But thank you that that's not the end, that we have a Savior who suffered like we do, the end. He suffered and rose and beat death, the greatest 
stealer of life was not the end for Jesus Christ, and our suffering and the deaths in our life are not the end for us, for those who hope in his name, that even we, posterity generations later, can have hope today because we know Jesus beat death, his voice was heard, and for us, death is finished for all the abhorred and the afflicted who cry out to his name. So I pray, God, we would cling to you and trust you and sing to you in the hard days so that the nations, our coworkers, our classmates, our friends can see that we suffer for a night, joy comes, and that they would come join the banquet of those who've put all their hope in the rescuing one. Thank you, King Jesus, for being sympathetic and being victorious. Thank you that we get to be yours. Comfort us this week, we pray, in the beautiful name of Jesus. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just talked about Psalm 22 That's and right. the topic of suffering, which there is a lot on the doctrine of suffering. Right. Um, and one of the most challenging things to wrap your mind around and understand as a believer. Mm. And um, the question that we had come in today is probably one of the most popular questions mm -hmm. um, about suffering. And so I'm just gonna ask you and we'll start from there. Okay. What about those that pray to God in the manner that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but are not delivered? What, mm. what does the word say about that? Yeah, well, um, that's something we have to be careful you're not over-promising, like what does delivered mean? I mean, you think about in Jesus' experience, how far did God let it go? Mm. To the grave, to over, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if we're saying, oh, I think I should read these passages and go, then whatever difficulty I'm in, God will get me out of it at some point. You go, God will let it go a lot further than we think we sh it should sometimes and let it go all the way to death. It did for Jesus. But the hope we have as Christians that really pops and really stands out at like funerals is our hope extends beyond the mm. grave. Like Jesus went into the grave, total absence of life, total end of life, but that was not his end. He rose and beat death. And so we look at ourselves and go, whatever suffering I go through, and however long it extends, it will not ultimately be my end. And if someone goes, well, that's kind of cheap um, comfort. Everybody's going to die, and you're saying our suffering might go to mm -hmm. death. You go, yeah, but if all you have is death is the end, that's a hopeless existence. It is. The hope of Christianity is even death is not the end for us. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's life beyond it. And so that's where you look and go, Jesus is pretty clear with his disciples. You associate with me, it's it's going to be trouble. And he said, some of you will be imprisoned. And he said, the Holy Spirit will be with you to give you words to say mm. before they kill you. And then they'll kill you. And so it's interesting that he says, the Spirit of God will be with you, but not to save you. Mm. He'll let you die like Stephen, let you be stoned to death. And yet even then you're not a victim. Christ mm. rises to greet you and you have a hope and a future that extends into forever. And so for me, when I experience physical pain, and mine isn't near what other people have, I go, I'm asking him to make it stop now. I'd like for him to stop it soon. But I understand that he may have purposes that extend my whole life. Mm. And I know that ultimately it won't be my end. There will be a day when all this trouble's gone. And for me, that hope of resurrection becomes even greater in my soul the more pain I experience. You realize probably every third verse in the New Testament mm -hmm. is about our hope beyond the grave. Mm -hmm. And so I would say lean into that. It's not always about direct deliverance from this thing I'm in right now. It may tarry much longer than you want it to, but God is still sovereign and God is good. And though we weep now, at the end, we won't have questions. We will have celebration. There is sense to it. Uh, anyway, I could say more, but that's probably 
there's a Good. lot to yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. A lot to say. I, it makes me go to Romans 8, where this light and momentary suffering is nothing compared to the glory of what we will experience and just clinging Absolutely. to that hope that we have in Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. Great message today. I love yeah. how last week and this week were both the prophecy and the parallels. Um, right. So great message. Thanks. Glad to have you back with us it again today. Looking yeah. forward to seeing you next time. And thanks for joining us today for Postscript. Keep your questions coming. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.